Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty great coincidence that I have this project that bounds uh, agroecology, urban agriculture, and water. Um, and this need came because Brazilian cities has this uh, urgent need to people see what we have problem. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a pretty nervous because I don't speak English. <laughs> But uh, we have such a problems in cities that comes to uh, imbalance in our environment and with social inequities. And I thought, wow, why, why can we see that as a unique problem and try to find a unique solution for that? But first of all, I would like to introduce you my research group in Brazil. And this is my supervisor in Brazil, Kelly. And uh, we work actually the group called Hydrology of forest ecosystems. So we, did, we, we do a lot of research about how the forest interact with water and how the restoration interacts with water because in Brazil we, we do so much work about how we, we can plant the forest again, but we don't actually concern about if this forest is, is gonna contribute to the water cycle. So we study this kind of thing in Brazil. We also we study like spring conservation, water sources conservation, watershed management, and I'm the only one in the group actually that studies the hydrology in cities. So I'm the first, but I think right now it's gonna come more people because people are getting interested in the subject. And here is what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today. That is my project. I'm already in my third year, so I have a little results to show you. And each, uh, Topic is one chapter from my thesis, the, and this one just came right now. It wasn't supposed to be in my thesis, but in this month I decided to develop it, and I'm gonna talk to you about it. And first of all, uh, I'd like to show you what is Brazil. This is Brazil, nice to meet you. Uh, Brazil has, uh, it's a really big country. I mean, it's the fifth, 50, 50 biggest country in the world. So we have a, a, such a diversity, not only cult cultural, cultural, cultural diversity, but also uh, environmental di diversity. Uh, we have so many people, as you can see, we have a lot of people in there. And we have three different kinds of climate. You have like equator, equatorial climate here in this region. We have tropical um, here in the coast mainly. And we have also semi-arid which is in here in Northwest. Uh, and until today, our main economy bases in exportation of primary products. So agribusiness and agriculture uh, takes such a huge place in our economy until these days. And here is the precipitation map, which is uh, pretty much why we have so much biodiversity because we have so much different uh, climates in here is the rainforest exactly where is rainwater is the Amazonia, our rainforest. And here in the semi-arid, semi -arid, we have like a kind of desert. Not a desert, but really similar to a desert. And here, here's Sao Paulo, where I live. We have like more tropical weather. And this is our biomas, our main ecosystems. And Amazonia, which is I think the most famous one, and it's really amazing, have lots of big mammals and biodiversity, big trees and a lot of rivers and stuff. Uh, we have Caatinga, which is the only uh, ecosystem in the world. We don't have Caatinga in anywhere else, so it's particularly from Brazil. And it is like um, composed with cactus and uh, dry trees and, and this kind of, but, but also has a lot of biodiversity. We try to study it, but um, we have a lot. Here we have also Cerrado, which is Brazilian savanna, and also like more dry kind of ecosystem, which the trees are more, I don't know how to say this in English, but more. <laughs> and uh, we have Mata Atlântica. Sao Paulo stays in the area who is in transition, like ecotonum, ecot, ecot, no, I don't know this word means, in English, but we have like that transition between Cerrado and Mata Atlântica here in Sao Paulo. Mata Atlântica is just an amazing ecosystem. It's like a coast ecosystem. You just go all Brazil. 
and particularly I love Santa Uh And we also have like Pantanal. Um, Pantanal is like wetland, and so in the rainy season it's just all water, all wet. And we have Pampa, which is our smallest bioma, which is more like a grassy field, but it also has a biodiversity. And right now, we, we have so much problem with loss in these ecosystems and these biomas. Uh, in Amazonia, 20% is already gone, which is way much because Amazonia is so big. Uh, we have in Cerrado, 45% that is was already lost. And I think the most concerning is about Mata Atlântica, our tropical forest, is 93%, it's already gone. So we have like 7% of all that we have in biodiversity, plants and animals, which is kind of worry. <laughs> but it also comes, uh, is, I think part of it is because in the coast area where most urbanized cities are, so it's just big degradation. And what is the main cause of deforestation in Brazil? It's agribusiness. And uh, this is a photo that I don't know exactly for taking from Brazil, but this kind of happens a lot. Like the plane throwing agrochemicals through the plantations, and was a case a few years ago, actually that they, they passed to a school, a school, a little school, their little kids were playing in the backyard and just throw the agrochemicals on top of the kids' head. So we have like main problems with that. And also deforestation, uh, not only for agriculture, but for cow creation, livestock creation. And if you can see in this chart that I made, actually they are not producing food because they only produce 30% of our foods. Who is actually producing food in Brazil are family farming and family agriculture but they don't get any, I mean, not any, but really small incentives. Like in grants, they only receive 44% of the grants, and the agribusiness receives 86% of the grants. So uh, it is a thing that we, we try to change a little bit, but it, it's really hard. In the, in, to these days, it's hard to struggle with that. This is, I, I think, is the, our most rural, rural problems, countryside problems. And in cities, we also have a lot of problems. Uh, this is Sao Paulo, <laughs> which is, I, I couldn't pick a better picture from Sao Paulo, but I think this is a reality in Sao Paulo. This is the main river that crosses Sao Paulo, the called Tietê. And is the, this is the main road, this side and this side. And when it rains, this river just floats everywhere. <laughs> and so all these trees just became underneath the water. And I don't, I don't know why this kind of thing happens in Brazil, but people just put concrete inside of the rivers. This is so common, a lot of places. And also the river is so polluted. I mean, there's actually a couch in the river. Sometimes they find cars in the river and it's just, and they try for 20 years now to, to um, the opposite of pollution, like deep pollution, it's not a, but they're trying to make the river healthy again but then it's not working so far. So the river is still really polluted. And we also have a lot of kind of other problems in cities. We have poverty, a lot of poverty that's growing so big in cities. We have like uh, no sewage or we throw in the sewage and the rivers uh, without any treatment. And we also have problems with scarcity, or water scarcity. And what we can identify that is common in all these problems is that we have no production of ecosystem services in cities. So we don't produce food, we don't produce uh, water regulation, we don't produce water regulation that don't produce water for people to drink. So it's always a common problem that we could, uh, I think, nah, that, we, that we could um, try to help a little bit if we start to provide ecosystem services in, in cities. And here's just um, a little definition of what ecosystem services are. So they are, they, they are divided in four categories. They are supporting services. Um, they are provision services, which is food and fresh water. And food, I think, is the easiest one for us to see. 
And we have like regulation services, like water regulation, which is what I work with. And we have like the cultural services. And the question that I did before I started this research was, what can we do to improve the ecosystem services provision in cities? And uh, when you look to a urban garden, I think it's pretty clear the food provision service, well, produce food. Also, I think here in Europe, I, I, I came to realize that it's always that common to see like cultural services, well-being and pleasure activity and another stuff. But the water regulation in these places was something that I couldn't find in literature. Like, but these places help to regulate the water in cities. This, this soil is better for infiltrate water than another kinds of soil. So with that question in mind, I started to do my project. That, have to, that has the main goal of evaluate the urban gardens as alternatives to mitigate the problems caused by soil impermeabilization in the same way that could help to uh, balance the social inequities in cities. And to do that, I did like first a bibli bibliographic survey, then I do a field work, a one year field work, then I do, uh, now I'm doing some international data comparison, and I do a more applied study case. This I, I put in my presentation always in Brazil, but I don't think it's necessary because in here you understand a lot maybe more than me about this, uh, but how the, the um, urban agriculture just came in the world. And I think it's really pretty much connected to the wars, wars, wars. And um, <clears throat> well, these wars, is, I think I don't have to say, but I think we have a good example in Cuba, like about how Cold War can help to shape the urban agriculture. Like people after the war, um, the Cold War in the, when, I don't know how to say it, but when the Russian just split apart, like uni Soviet Union? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and they just uh, became isolated from commerce, like embargo, and they have to start looking for other ways to produce food without agrochemicals and near to the places where people actually eat because you don't have fuel, fuel to transportation. And they start to grow food in the city, and I think it's I visit there, and I think it's a, a great example. And this is from my bio, bio, bio my, my survey in the papers. <laughs> and we have like I, I divided the papers that I that I found. I like two hundred and and papers. I just divide in just five years old papers. I didn't get more older papers. But uh, I divided in where the study was conducted in. So I divide in very high, uh, currently the, I don't know if I put this in, human development index, yeah, it's in English. It's very high, high, average, and low. So the very high countries, uh, I found that community gardens are a theme that is pretty much studied, people are discussing a lot, and I think it pretty much focused on health and well-being and why people can gain in cultural services from that. And in high developing countries, which Brazilians in here, we have a more concern about soil contamination. In Brazil, the main researchers that do urban garden project, he works about soil contamination. I think he's the only one that actually is doing international papers about it. And well, we, he studied that it's safe for you to eat the projects, the products in the urban agriculture which I think here is not even a question because it's so different where you are cultivating. In, in Sao Paulo, for instance, you just cultivate the garden and literally attached to the garden are just big roads and just so many cars passing by and so many pollution, so he's concerned about that, the people are concerned about that. Then in average, uh, <laughs> not average countries, uh, average high developing countries, uh, sustainability is the word that pops out, and not only sustainability is such a big word. I mean, you can say sustainability for so many different things, but in here in this con context, I found that sustainability is more like a sustainable practice, so agroecological agri practices and stuff, and 
how I already was expecting, the low uh, age DI country was talking about food security. And in Brazil, uh, I started to wonder, well, I don't have, I, I couldn't find in literacy uh, much stuff, but I'm gonna just search in informal ways, like journals, local journals, and uh, local magazines to see what's going on, and sites, websites. And then I found that actually in all Brazilian states, they are works with urban agriculture. They are not just, they are just not organized in, in one Brazilian politics, but they are happening like spontaneously. People are just growing food, people growing food in here, people growing food there. And, but all states, is, it's going on. And I brought three examples that is so different from, for you see how can can be plural. Uh, this is Sete Lagoas in Minas Gerais. I just met a guy who works in Belo Horizonte here. And Sete Lagoas is kind of near Belo Horizonte. Not that near, but kind of near. And this is like an example for a government support that people, they had like a, I didn't know. People had like a um, habitation program where when they build their houses, they, in the land in front of the houses, they could grow food and the government don't charge anything for that. The only thing that government really charge is that part of the production goes to the government, the government buys, and goes to the uh, school food for kids, for merenda, and the uh, hospital and stuff, and everything is organic. So it's a really great example, but it's a really small city as well, so it's, it's easy to, to implant, it, implant it. Then we have like the opposite example is that uh, an urban garden that is made in the top of one of the most biggest malls in Brazil, they call it El Dorado Mall. And they are just growing food in here. And the food that grows in here, the vegetables, they just send to the restaurants. And then the rest, the compost, not the compost, but the organic garbage goes again to the compost. And then they put it here. So it's like, I don't know if I can call a mall sustainable, but it's a sustainable practice in the mall. And we also have in favelas and communities. We have a lot of examples that also is not like, it's informal, they just growing food in everywhere they can grow food. And, but it's happening, I mean, a lot of people are doing that, not only for food security, but also to help a little bit in the income. Well, the my first chapter was that, to just do a context about it. And then this second chapter, I really aim to the water question, I mean, it is really helping in the water regulation. First of all, I identify what are urban permeable areas. And in Brazil, I could find four main urban permeable areas that are repair, riparian forests. We have a lot of riparian forests in the middle of the city because we have a lot of rivers. Rivers are everywhere in Brazil. We have parks, uh, urban garden, and vacant lands. This is like a vacant land looks like in Brazil. They're just garbage and sometimes they are creating bugs and stuff. I don't know if bugs is the right word, but sometimes water accumulating here, like the project that you're trying. And the water gets stops and sometimes it's a disease problem. So this is uh, the land that I did my research was exactly this one. And sometimes they had so much garbage in there that I could even enter to do my research. I have to do, come back and put some gloves and stuff. And, and I, I have to use like proper boots to not be beat by animals because it really can be a really issue. Um, and already looking, we can see that it's totally different. They are permeable in the same way they don't have concrete, but they are so different, so different characteristics. And I do a 12 month. Uh, collection and I do, I use four parameters. I did water infiltration rate, soil penetration resistance, the words we are in the middle are the, the worst one, the penetration resistance, humidity, and density. I did that in seven different um, areas. The riparian forest I did it only in one 
because uh, riparian forest, I adopted like a referential area where I expected that the better results would be in riparian forest because, I mean, forest, you kind of expect that they, they infiltrate more water than in other places. And this is the equipment that I use. Um, they call penetrolog, and it can reach 60 centimeters from the soil. And this is, this is me doing in a urban garden, because if I did that in the, some lands, it just didn't go. I didn't could even, I just put, it didn't go anymore. So this is like a good soil that goes out to the end. This is the mini disc that I use that is in photometer. And to use the mini disc, I have to do like a soil analysis to see a composition of the soil because the um, infiltration rates, it var varies, varies, it changes uh, when we have different kinds of clay in the soil, percentage of clay. So I have to do this analysis. And I did the humidity analysis in the old fashioned way. So <laughs> I collect the, the soil in the rings and I put it dry and then it And also to do the density, I, I use the volumetric rings. Just to show the result, I'm gonna show some graphics. So I'm just showing uh, the parameters that we use from Penetrolog. Uh, vacant land is different for everyone because of the clay percentages, but all the others, what we consider that is critical is 4,000, 4,000, 4,000, uh, more than 4,000 KPA, which is a strength measure, like how much strength you have to do to put the equipment in the soil. And this is my graphics, my results that I could run and finish to show you today. I'm so happy to be there already. Uh, this is my referential area. And, well, I expect to show the better results, but as you can see, it doesn't show the better results. Um, we have uh, strengths that goes near to 6,000 KPA, 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 which means that it's so compact, the soil. And we can see the urban gardens, we have none that goes beyond the critical point that was 4,000. Uh, actually, and another thing that is, is good to uh, highlight me is that 50 centimeters it can measure anymore, which means that I don't know. Uh, uh, we can measure anymore, and also we can expect that the water is gonna have a lot of hard time to infiltrate it beyond that. And in the urban, we can see that it's just keep going, keep going. And the park actually has a really similar results to the riparian forts, which is really unbelievable as well because parks are just grass. In, in the places that I did the collection was just grass. And they have similar results to the, to the riparian forts, but also worse than the urban garden. And the vacant land. This vacant land actually had a good result. And I don't have an explanation for that yet. I'm gonna have to start looking for it. But we have this one, which is the worst of all of them. As you can see, that it's just so, um, um, where something is like, not regular, not regular. And we have like some kind of analysis that couldn't measure more than 25 centimeters, which is really, this, so this is really. Sure. Yeah. At the same spot or a different spot? At the same spot, exactly the same spot. To measure the difference between the rainy season and the dry season, to see if it had a difference. And this is the infiltration rates. I was just start, I tried to finish the statistics, statistics analysis into today, but I couldn't. But this is like the raw results. Uh, as you can see, the garden one, two and garden one, they were like the best results in infiltration rates, then the riparian forest comes, then the rest of it, which is, I mean, you can see that from infiltration, parks and vacant lands has no uh, substantial difference. And in humidity as well, garden and garden are the best rates. And I think we, we should expect that because 
humidity and infiltration, they are corre correlated, as, as well as infiltration are correlated to compactation, and humidity is related to compactation, they're all somehow related, but I couldn't finish that to show you, but in my final work, I, I'm gonna do that. And I did, after I did that, I was like, okay, I did all this survey, like 12 months and stuff, but I can also, I have to think that perhaps the conditions were different in these areas. I mean, I don't know if only the use of soil is the, is the factor that changing the compactation, the infiltration. So I decided to find a place where I could do the repairing forest, the park, and the urban garden analysis in the same, exactly the same area. So then, well, it's not gonna be anything different but the use of soil. And I found this watershed in Sao Paulo, in the middle of Sao Paulo, which is totally urbanized for the shit. And I, I, I couldn't do, I could do that in the same place. And this watershed is just a big example of what uh, Brazilian cities has done to the rivers. This is the Pinheiro River, which is the second biggest river after Tete. And it was all like winding. And, and then was totally ratified. And this kind of um, construction or infrastructure that they do. Uh, also, the, the Coruja River was canalized. So a big part of it was canalized. And this kind of thing really uh, increases the flood problems. Because the river has a tendency to just uh, the meadow, it's called meadow, right? So when it rains a lot, the meadow just And here is just a photo of what, what happens when it rains. I mean, all this. Uh, and here is the water source of the river. Yeah, this is, it's so, this is water source. It's so in, interesting, in a way, that how water can be strong, because it's just in the middle of the concrete. You are just walking in the street, and then you have, in, in Sao Paulo, this, this happens. You have, like, water source, sources just you think like some pipe is just broken because apparently some pipe, no, but it's actually a water source and in the middle of the concrete. And to try to, I still have a little time, right? Yeah. To try to um, uh, help this kind of flood problem that, that, that was happening in the watershed, they did a project and the project as everything in Brazil, the planning was unbelievable. You read the project, it was like, oh my gosh, it's incredible. They're thinking everything, it's gonna be great. But when they start to do the execution, we have so much problems. Uh, for instance, the bills well that was suggested, they actually do a conventional ditches, which is totally different from a bills way. I mean, it's the opposite of the bills way. And stormwater and catchment buzzing, that was, uh, they say that they were gonna do in the project, they were not built. So can you imagine you do like conventional ditches, where you're supposed to do bills well, and then you don't build the stormwater catchment basin. So all the water flow is gonna start to run to the river, it's gonna to. And they also, they talked about creating permeable pavements, but in the end it was so expensive in the project, so they just does the regular pavement and the vegetation which I, I think is the most important thing because vegetation is the natural way for you to stop the floating. <laughs> and we have to plant vegetation inside of, of the rivers. It's just such a common knowledge and people are still not doing that. And another thing that really pisses me off about Brazil, sorry about that, but I really get so, is because they have, I don't know why, but they just plant exotic trees in everywhere. I mean, why? We have such a biodiversity and they get like a tree from Australia, and they just put in Brazil because it's more pretty. And, and this is really make me mad sometimes. And it actually happens in a lot of parks, in a lot of spaces in Brazil. Uh, well, why floats happen? There's a lot, a bunch of reasons, like impermeabilization of the soil, but also we have to see if the watershed has already natural tendencies to floods, because it happens, watersheds had different kind of tendency to floods, and then I do a morphometric analysis, um, and I found out that this watershed that I was dealing with, already for, for his shape, 
already has higher propulsive to float um, because she's like near to a circle. Um, they have, in there has moderate, mo yeah, this is lopping, and uh, which is not that bad, but which is really, uh, I think, determining to have like erosion and stuff is uh, the red, yellow argisol, which is a really permeable and, anyway, it has higher propensity to erosion. And so we can take from that is, okay, this water should already, already have a big tendency to floods, but what can we do to improve that? Not that project that wasn't built correctly at all. And uh, was in this watershed that I choose to do my other field work, my, my study cases. So I, I picked this park. This is the park. And this is the three completely different areas of the same park. This is the, I call park here, but as you can see, it not even has grass. Not even grass is growing here. It's just soil, just soil. Here, here we have the riparian forest, like the Kurusha River, you can see. And here we have the Kuruja Urban Garden, which is a pretty little garden in the middle of it. And I do the compactation analysis as well in there. Uh, I do, I, in this case, I didn't do the monitoring. I just did one time, but I did way more analysis. I did like 10 analysis in, we, in each area. And we got these results that uh, gladly they just match with my previous results that the park is just the worst. This park is just the worst of all time because we only have like 10 centimeters of uncompacted soil and the riparian forest is not that good as well, but the urban garden go down to the end. So it's a good result for me. <laughs> and the only explanation is the soil, that is what they do in, in the soil. Because this is a panoramic picture. So here's the, here's the riparian forest, here is the garden, and here is the other area. So it's just in the same place. But you, as you can see, the, the soil is totally different. Here, like the, con I mean, it has a tree, and it has concrete. I, I, I can't stand with it. You just put concrete in the, surrounding the tree. So it's really bad. Here we have the garden, which is have a lot of vegetation. And here we like the grass area, which it has no grass because I don't know why. I, don't, I actually don't know why. I don't know if it's because it's too shadow or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but the more special results that I got from this is that when we look for springs in Brazil, we have like maps. I think I hear, I suppose, the same way. We have maps that say where the springs are, and I look at these maps, and they are not indicating any springs in this place, but when they start to management the urban garden, a spring just came up in the middle of the garden. It just pop out. And people, I, I think people don't realize how important that is, because when I, I come there to talk to them, they're like, oh yeah, and I, yeah, yeah and you know what happened? It's like water in here. But I mean water in here, just popping by. It's not, it's not that common, it's not that usual. But actually the good management and the good practice in the soil just make water a floodate in Brazil. A flood air, I don't know if it has similar in English. But the water just came to the surface, which is pretty much unbelievable. And then they start to plant like uh, more, they, they still have, uh, the vegetation, the small vegetation and stuff, but they decided to plant more, not trees, I don't know if you call a banana tree a tree, but like a tree, like a tree. And it's totally pro protected right now, so they don't use this area anymore, the spring is protected. And after they start to protect the spring, others start to come up in the middle. Right now I think they have five, just little, Water pumping back. This is an example. If you look carefully, you just see water comes from the soil. And they also have a big concern about water infiltration. This is an infrastructure, infrastructure that we don't even have a name for that because they created in there. But they just dig a big holes in the floor. I don't know. 
if you have a name for it in, in here. But they just drag the big holes and they put rocks and stuff to the, help the water infiltrate it. They have rain gardens, and which not only help the water infiltration, but also helps the quality of water that is infiltrating. And they have the water from the spring that they use to do the irrigation. irrigation. So this is just my favorite example because it's so good to show how, how urban agriculture can help in the water management in cities. And, well, I said all of that, but why I'm here exactly? Uh, when I did my research, I started my field like, in total I did like two years of going and seeing. You know? And what I found out about Brazil is that they don't have absolutely not support from the government. And when I say they don't have support, sometimes they have to struggle with the government. Like, but we're, we're playing food in here, but no, you cannot stay here, you just have to. And it, it's always this conflict in there. And also they have problems with, with water bills. Sometimes the water bills they use for tap water for irrigation are so high that it's more expensive than what they do all month long selling the products. So it's just insane. I mean, it's not, this cannot continue. And they have difficulties with commercialization as well. And they have all said, I don't, I, I don't really understand that, but sometimes at night, people go to the garden, it just destroy things and go away. I don't know why this happens. Actually, I don't have explanation for that. And a, a Brazilian government came with a grant, like, ah, if you have innovative ideas to do abroad. And I was like, oh, I want to go. Please, please let me go. Because uh, I, I would like to see what is working here, what is good in here, and to show, because Brazilian has such a, I, I hate this. They have like a um, syndrome that always the other places are really good, they work, but in here it's not gonna work. I mean, it works in Europe, but in here Brazil, it can, it's not gonna work. Why it's not gonna work? So let's see what we have in good in here, so I can bring this to Brazil and say, oh, it's working there, it's gonna work, work in here. And I did this project that I wanna help to contribute to the public policies that involves uh, urban agriculture in Brazil. We still don't have, uh, a direction from the federal, we don't have a federal law that talks about urban agriculture yet, so we can help to build this law and build this law in the way that actually is gonna do some good for people and for the environment. So it's basically why I'm here. <laughs> and to do comparison, I start to do some research in Brazil in the urban gardens and I'm gonna use the same questions that I did in there, I'm gonna do here so I can compare the results. Um, as you can see, the most of urban gardens in Sao Paulo, here is in Sao Paulo, I mean. in Sao Paulo are community gardens, uh, the majority of them. Irrigation it actually varies a little bit, varies. We have like the spring water irrigation. You know what, this is not even legal, if I, if I say to you. To, do, to use the spring water, actually we have to do like a process to get authorization. But people are using, and I couldn't say that it's wrong, because from the law point of view it is, but I don't think it's completely wrong. And public supply are just the menus and tanks. They also use cisterns. Cisterns? Is correct. Um, they use cisterns, but we have the question, if it's safe to use the water that rains in the city to do irrigation. Is that something I'm gonna speak when I'm done? And uh, one, one thing that I found out, it's all the lands were public vacant lands. So what people do in Brazil, actually, they are singling, and there's garbage, and there's nothing going on, nor, nor useful, either for society or for the environment, and people just start growing food in there. And I think this is amazing, and I think they should be supported for doing that. Uh, all gardens are organics. I couldn't find anyone using agrochemicals, which is really good as well. And none of the garden has any effective government support. And just things that I find interesting in the, when I was doing the, the data collection is that uh, they use several agroecological practice and sometimes they not even realize they're used. It's just a knowledge that's common for him. Like, ah, we're just gonna do this cover up with the 
the organic material, and they do composting as well. Um, I think all the gar I, I wouldn't say all, but a lot of them has compostate, composting, composting. And they also grow bees, which is native bees, Brazilian native bees, to do the pollinization. And this is a really big non-governmental organization, NGO. Yeah, it's very. Um, they call Cidade Sem Fome, which is City Without Hunger. And it's a really good organization that helps people. And this organization is taking money, taking money, not taking money, they're just getting money for the companies. Companies like big enterprises, and they're just investing in urban agriculture. And then the questions that I did in Brazil involve all these aspects, like agroecological practice, water management, like where the water comes from, what, how you, you irrigate it, and incentives, which is very important, like you get any incentives from the government to do it, and land ownership, and this kind of stuff. And just to finish, this is the experiments that I'm doing here in CAR. Because in my first week here, Steve will show me around. And he was like, whoa, we have this geotex geotextile that helps to water infiltration, to permeable pavements, permeable pavements and stuff. I was like, oh, that's really great. But I'm wondering if this could help to grow food as well. I mean, if you put that, you can actually grow food. And it's going to help to hold the humidity of the soil so people don't have to use that much water. And well, I had this question. I was like, oh, let's try. Let's see it. So I'm doing some trial to see if this geotextile can actually help to hold the soil humidity. So I'm doing, yeah, I'm doing that in two different soils. This is a substrate, which is a soil that was bought, bought from a company. And this is like natural compost. And I'm doing a comparison. And let's see it. But if it work out, works out well, and I'm, I'm seeing, oh, no, it really helps to hold the humidity, the next step is to try to find a natural material that could do the same. And because this is not that cheap to buy, one. And two, this is not that sustainable. <laughs> so this is the first step. And if it works, I'm going to try to do more research afterwards. Like postdoc is just in here. Like. <laughs> and uh, another investigation that I'm starting to do in Brazil, I'm not there right now, but I have people doing that for me as I'm here. And I'm doing analysis from the rainwater quality that is raining in cities because the cisternas, I don't know if I can recommend them to people. People say like to me, oh, can I put a cistern in here? I was like, I don't know. I don't know if this water is good. It's not as technical person. I cannot say, oh, it's secure. Go ahead because I'm not sure. So I'm just in the gardens that I work with. I install like pluviometers and I'm going to do one year monitoring to see if the rain that's falling in there is actually proper for irrigation. So this is already going on in Brazil. And <laughs> actually, people are like, oh, you're lucky, right? You're just out in the rainy season. You're back in the drought season. I was like, not my fault. But they are doing that for me right now. <laughs> I have a graduation student that is helping me with that. And, and that's it. Thank you so much, you guys. <laughs>